and welcome to the Diana Initiative CTF. Um, my name is Marcel and I'm one of the organizers for the CTF. So we're going to step through just a few housekeeping type things and then I'm going to kick it over to Jay for the CTF for Noobs workshop. Alrighty. So first off, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, MongoDB is our prize sponsor. They gave us some money to buy fabulous prizes for everyone. And also TryHackMe. We are using the TryHackMe platform for the CTF today. Um, it's the first time I've used it for a CTF, but uh, I think it's going to be pretty fabulous. So excited about that. And then thank you also to Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu and eLearn Security for donating prizes, more fabulous prizes. Okay, so I also want to give a shout out to the amazing CTF team. Uh, this is in alphabetical order, but we've got Aaron. Aaron is our MC, and if you haven't been to the CTF uh, Village Room yet, you definitely need to go there and check out uh, the awesome music he's playing. Uh, Blue Fox is our, our prize wrangler, so he's working on putting all those prizes together. Christina is our badass reverse engineer who did some of those malware challenges that you'll be looking at. Jay is our, our CTF for Noobs workshop person and also built a number of challenges. Jamie built a number of challenges, a web application, which is not my strong suit. So I'm really glad that we had some other folks on the team to do those. Joe did uh, OSINT challenges. Kristen did a variety of challenges and, uh, and peer review, which was a huge part of the process. Uh, Tabby, also a co-organizer and did challenges too. Tyrone, same thing, co-organizer and lots of challenges. And, and he really built out the entire platform in TryHackMe, so I really appreciate that. And Zara, more challenges. And Zoe, some more of the web app challenges. So a fabulous team. Um, some of these people I've known for years, others I've never even met. So uh, if you're interested in getting involved next year, hit me up. Okay, so to get started, the CTF is already going. Um, if you haven't started yet, don't worry, it's going to be running the duration of the conference. Um, I have a tiny URL there, but it's basically the Try Hack Me site. And you just need to uh, create an account and then it'll ask you for like a code to join a room and you can just type in that Diana Initiative CTF. Um, so jump into the challenges, or if you want a little extra assistance, attend the workshop that Jay's giving, where we will be doing some sneak preview walkthroughs of some of the challenges and uh, and go from there. So, so how you play. So Try Hack Me is set up for individual play only. If you want to do team play, you would have to create an, a team amongst you and whoever else, and then uh, use a shared login. So I'm always reluctant to say use a shared login as I have in the picture there, what could possibly go wrong? But uh, in this case, that's the only way to, to have a team. So for support during the, um, the CTF, you can reach out to our volunteer team in the Capture the Flag Village. Um, and just do chat there. If you have like specific questions, send a, a direct message um, to me or one of the other admins. Um, I'm in there as literally CTF admin um, and we'll announce other volunteers as they're on hand. Um, we're only gonna be doing like official support during the conference hours. So if it's in the middle of the night and you're stuck on a question, we probably won't be able to help you, but um, I'm always happy to see the evolution of chat between the different players and um, and uh, you know helping each other and stuff like that. So anyway, um, and you can also create your own breakout sessions within that room. So if you have like a team, you can have a little team group um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so winners and prizes, there will be both. Um, we are actually still working out prizes because we're getting uh, new things coming in like as we speak. So none of that will be announced until tomorrow. Um, one thing to note is if you decide to go the team route and you have like 20 people on your team, everybody will not get a prize. I, I wish I could say prize for you, prize for you, prize for you, but it's not going to work that way. It'll be limited. So you'll have to divvy them up amongst yourselves. So that's it. Um, let's get going and, and do some, 
some challenges. And I'm going to pass this over to Jay so she can start the CTF for Noobs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marcel. Hey, look, it could be one person watching or 10 people watching. I'm not sure. I got to make this fun for myself. Otherwise, I'll go nuts. It feels like I'm talking to myself. Um, let me get the screen going. Um, go. Oh, there we go. Hi, um, this is CTF for News. Bear with me. This is my first time doing this training um, live for anyone. Um, I go by Jay, sociable engineer on Twitter. Um, I'm a cyber tester. I own and operate the um, Hacker Runway, the shop in the contest. I love doing in CTFs. I'm not good, but I love doing them. I am forever a student. I always try to learn new things. I'm a member of the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, and you can contact me on Twitter or my email. I can warn you that I probably won't respond to my email as quickly as I, as I will to Twitter. Um, you can find the presentation on the following link, tinyurl.com, CTF for News. I will, uh, I will have someone then type that in the, um, in the stage. Um, Women in Cyber Jitsu have been around for about geez, seven years, six years, six or seven years. God damn. And um, it started with a bunch of ladies, um, and Lisa Jagget was the um, was the creator. Um, but you also have Mary and Marcel. They got together and they started a study group, basically to get the, um, to get women the hands on um, training that you wouldn't normally find unless you were part of a, um, one of the elite groups. So I uh, found them on Meetup, joined them, and oh, expand my slideshow. Sorry, let me do that. I hold up. I am looking for how to do that. Yeah. Oh, screen. Better? Sorry about that. I okay. I uh, um I joined the group, did some studies with the and did some studying with them. I was able to change the um, change career path by um, working with them and studying for the um, the security plus, and that as you know is history. Um, right now they have over five thousand members. Um, we're all over the U.S. and we even have some international members. Uh, what is a CTF? Today we're here to learn about capture the flags. The original meaning came from capturing the enemy's uh, flag during the battle, you know, during war and whatnot. Um, that's if we're not, we haven't had enough of those. But in InfoSec, um, it, cyber, uh, capture the flag referred to um, competition um, where you get to solve scavenger-like um, challenges or puzzles. And your main goal is to find a vulnerability that will lead to something, um, something to compromise the system. So uh, think of the CTF as a practice to what you're doing in the real world. Um, who can play? Um, for, um, for the short answer, playing is for anyone. You want to... Um, you want to join in, sorry, I'm trying not to read the, the little things that are coming up on the screen. Um, playing is for um, for anyone. It's for students, then they're usually the target audiences. You have professionals will play these. You have companies and um, companies will put out in CTFs as a potential um, way to find new hires. And there's challenges anywhere from beginners to advanced. Yeah. Um, why should you play? Because it's fun. I mean, like you're you're doing puzzles, you're solving challenges, and sometimes you get a whole lot of money to do this. So it's a way for you to build your skills. Um, is 
a great way to learn things. Some people are tactile learners, some are audible learners. You can go and listen to a lecture and walk out of there, be an expert. But for a lot of folks, you need the hands-on for retaining knowledge, and I'm one of those. So I, I like doing the CTF because it helped me remember all the things that I'm learning um, by hand. Okay, it's also great for resume building. When you don't have experience, you know, when you get those job, um, those job listings that want you to come with 100 years of experience before you've even graduated, use your CTF challenges at, or your CTF experience as a form of experience. Now, I bet you had a lot of excuses. I did too before I started. Uh, you know, I'd rather watch. Um, I've, I've never done this before. Uh, I don't know enough yet. Um, I don't want to hold back the others because, you know, people are faster and they know what they're doing. And I don't know where to start. Well, start here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my first competition. Funny thing is, I don't remember much about the competition except for the fact that I had in, in the back of my mind that everybody else on the competition were better than me because they had been in competitions before. However, we were all still learning. And we had a challenge where we needed to go in and we were trying to elevate our privileges. And we thought we needed to change the config files. And somehow we ended up changing permissions and locked ourselves out of the system. And that was the end of the game for us. We couldn't log in um, and we couldn't, we couldn't play. Lesson learned, but that didn't stop me because I, I left with, uh, I left fired up wanting to do another challenge to do better the next time. So, you know, you get a CTF, you get a CTF, everybody gets a CTF. Um, CTFs are team based or individual. They can be in person or, you know, our new normal is remote. And they can be timed or open-ended and from new to advanced. You have all sorts of, you know, something for everyone. There are different and uh, different categories of challenges. Now, you can be, uh, you know, you can try to be jack of all trades, master of none, or you can form a team where you have somebody who is an expert in something in each of these. Or you can choose just to focus on one area and let that be your expertise. You have cryptography for those who like to solve puzzles and, and crack codes. You have steganography, steganography for those who like to solve, you know, figure out a way to find images or uh, images and files out of other images and files. Um, you have reverse engineering for uh, binary and exploiting the binary files. You have web application pen testing for those who are, um, uh, since everybody is in the cloud, you're on the web. A lot of the a lot of the attacks will come in to that and to that manner. So it's a it's a great skill to have. Um, you can do the um, the the root to boot type of challenges, or where you own the system upon the system. You can do network and traffic analysis, which is part of digital forensics, where you're going through and pick up files to um, find data that's exposed and that have been captured in um, in um, on text. Then um, with the digital forensics, you can do everything from the memory analysis to um, drive and disk drive analysis. And then you have your specialty type of events where it's the wireless uh, um, OSINT, which is open and open source intelligence. You have trivia sorts and where it's just basically Googling the heck out of stuff. And then social engineering, which is uh, more of a specialty type uh, thing where you are a lot of times it's set up as a um, a, a, a live event where you're calling a vision or trying to get information from people um, during a live um, a live phone call. Um, that brings me into the next one, where your types of competition you will have are the Jeopardy, where it is it, it can be a group of puzzles. You have uh, attack defense, mission based type um, challenges. A hybrid, which is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a mix of um, many, uh, two or more. And then you have your specialty challenges. All right. Um, for the offense, attack, uh, defense, you have, uh, those are usually for, 
I, I don't want to say elite teams, but they, they're usually really hard to get into. When I've looked for them anyway, they tend to be like uh, specially focused or a smaller type challenge where you have to qualify to get to that. Like DEF CON has their big one where people can do qualifications all year long. And then you have some of the ones that are listed on here um, with the cyber defense competition and whatnot. Your, your goal is to lock down your system while attacking your opponent. Usually everybody has the exact same systems that are given to them. And it's just a matter of how fast you can be in locking down your system while trying to uh, um, compromise those vulnerabilities you find on your system during the event. Yeah. For the Jeopardy style, um, it's, it's set up like Jeopardy, except you don't have to answer in the form of a question. You have, um, you have each, each category will have um, a point system um, depending on the, and depending on the challenge, depending on its difficulty, you will have um, everything from uh, a 25 point question, which might be your easy, and then a 100 point question, which might be a difficult uh, um, and challenge. So that's the kind you will usually see. That's, it, that's similar to what you will see today. We have like a, we have a hybrid of a Jeopardy and a um, hack the box type challenge. The mission-based um, challenges, um, I've seen them with Kaizen, I've seen them with Kringle, KringleCon, which used to be called Holiday Hack. It is based on um, a, a scenario you're given, a story, a storyboard, so to speak, where you, you work your way through the story and each question you solve is going to point you to the next, uh, the next answer you need. So you, you, you sometimes won't even know how many questions you have to solve on the entire uh, um, CTF board. Questions are revealed as you're going through it. All right. Um, for the hybrid, is a mix of them all. And most most competitions tend to be hybrid. Like I said, for today, you're going to be doing um, Jeopardy-style questions. You're going to have your 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 Google Foo challenges. You're going to have your PCAPs and everything else. But then you will also have some, um, some hack-the-box hack boxes where you're going to log into the box and then try to elevate your privileges and find the flag, sorry. Um, for the specialty challenges, um, CTF at Derby, oh, CTF, uh, SACTF, Derby is no longer around and uh, DC3 is no longer around, but there were specialty challenges. DC3 was all about uh, digital forensics and um, the uh, SACTF at DerbyCon, SACTF still happens, it's usually at, at DEF CON and um, this year they didn't do it, but um, it's it's you're given a company, and over a three week prior to the event time, you go and you know, gather information on it, and then you come back and do a live call while everybody is watching you in a in a quiet booth. Then you have the wall of sheep for the packet detective. Um, that's also held at DEF CON where you have PCAP uh, packages that you're being given and. You're going through, sifting through to see if you can find anybody plain to X password in the uh, in the data. Um, hope, uh, so hopelessly broken is another challenge that has to do with uh, IoT devices, mainly routers. And then you have the Trace Labs, which is um, relatively new, and it's all about helping helping real helping real time to find people that are actually missing. So it's not just a game, but it is a way to actually help your fellow human. Um, now, a slight detour from the um, from the capture the flag. You'll hear some people refer to capture the flag as a, ha a hackathon. It's not the same thing. A hackathon is basically where the the vulnerabilities have already been found, and now you gather your, your you know your brightest and best programmers to come together and solve whatever uh, problems you're having. You're um, doing a sprint. It's usually wrapped around a cause. Uh, I've seen them where they're doing them for, uh, um, you know, a company will have like a particular uh, um, item that they're putting out and like say a drone, for example, and they want to make sure that those are going to be secure from someone trying to take it over. So you have a hackathon and you, you bring in all your, your vulnerabilities and then tell people, hey, have at it, let's fix this problem or let's brainstorm to fix the problem. Okay, and then back to CTF. How do you prepare? You want to get your A-team together. 
you want to find like-minded individuals. I also like to find people who are who are spe specializing in other fields than what I know, because I know that I can't be good at everything. So I want to find people who are better than me at other things. Hope oh, that didn't lose you. I almost lost myself. Anyways, um, you find like-minded individuals. You want to find a focus area and hone your skills. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tend to pick a, a type of challenge and solve that for a few weeks, and then either I get stuck a lot more and I get or I get bored, and then I move on to something else. But I want to do that particular thing until I feel like I'm pretty comfortable at it, even if I'm not the expert. Then you'll want to build your home lab. Um, because it is illegal for you to go and hack at things that you don't own, build yourself a, a lab or join something like the TriAcme um, platform where you can go and they have a lot of uh, um, vulnerable machines that you can log into and hack and not worry about uh, any legal repercussions because you found something you weren't supposed to be looking for. You, you want to develop your toolkit, basically your set of tools that you're going to be using um, to make your, your um, CTF a lot smoother. And then you want to read and research um, walkthroughs. A lot of the challenges you see will repeat after time. And if you have, a, um, if you have your, if you've read through the walkthroughs, then it's not so, it's not so daunting and new to you. And even if you're in the middle of a challenge and you can't figure out what to do, if you Google, you might end up with a walkthrough that sounds similar to what you're looking for. And that way you can help build your skills. Um, for building your home lab, you need a virtual machine, uh, a hypervisor that you're going to run your other operating systems on top of. You want your attacker box. You can, it can be Kali Linux, Pen2, you got security, digital, and many other types out there. Um, and you need target boxes that you're going to exploit. You can do the uh, Metasploitable, um, some older Windows um, distributions, which you can find at the Microsoft site that they, they have available. You can do other Linux distribution. You can go to VulnHub, where they have a lot of uh, uh, vulnerable boxes that you can go and practice on. In our toolkit, excuse the noise for a second. Um, all right, Google, say it with me. Google, Google is your friend. There's you know they're invasive they get on um, you know they get into everything but they are your friend when it comes to hacking i google pretty much everything that i can't find and then if i don't google i don't, don't go it but it's the same deal all right the um the internet is it, it's a playground for you to find it, it, it's also somewhere for you to get and let down the rabbit hole looking at the and videos but um, uh, other than that, it's like you want to use Google to find the things that you need to help you. Um, Marcel's uh, GitHub link I posted here. She has a lot of um, a lot of links of places you can go and do a, a, to help solve a lot of the problems, especially when it comes to doing like the 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 binary, um, not not just binary. Sorry, to do any of the decrypting, the the uh, crypto, uh, cryptography, or doing like password uh, um, hashes and and stuff she has links to those if you go through a github she has like a link to a google file that you can then um, follow along um, for your basic tool set you want a, a text editor um, a hex editor wireshark and a lot of these are built into the cali operating system you you know for pen testing you want the nmap your birth suite which is what you use to capture uh, um, the the traffic before it goes to the website you know for you to stop and 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 edit things in, in, in live when you're trying to mess with the website. Um, Metasploit for doing your um, your easy exploitation on boxes. Um, if, you, if you're really good, you can go ahead and write your own with an, an MFS Venom or one of the other um, exploit type, but these are the easy to go, the easy go-to, sorry. Um, now we're at the part where we do the walkthroughs. Um, first, I can take some questions. Uh, 
Let's see here. Ah. I'm not sure if I want if I'm in the right place, but are there any questions, uh, moderators? Do you see any questions on the stage? While I try to while I log into my hack my try hack me box. Uh, all right. I can't hear you. I don't think we have any specific questions just okay. yet. Um, just more general, like how to do things. But my suggestion is for anybody who's in the CTF for Noobs workshop is just chillax and uh, and uh, try to learn some stuff from the workshop. Um, and the walkthroughs will be helpful. So. Okay, I, I have to log into my um, my try hack me. Okay, I did not do that. Um, so give me a few seconds, please. Do you want me to pull it up, Jay? Ah? Do you want me to pull up try hack me instead, or are you? Going no, to I just have to. Uh, um, I have to pull up my my window. I have to switch windows. Okay. I have it up oh. if you want to just use mine. Okay. Anyway. Ah? I don't know if I can because I won't be able to solve the problem. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So I have my uh, um, I have my um, Cali. I just need to log in. Okay. And just a reminder to everybody that we do have the the CTF village, and that's where the support chat is. So if you have specific questions, um, take it over there. And uh, if you have questions about this specific workshop, then post them in the the stage chat. Okay. Let's so, see. Let's try hack me and can you can you see that? Um, let me look. Um. Yes. Okay. I just need to find the Diana initiative because I have too many rooms. You have a lot of rooms. You've been using try hack me a lot. I see. There it is. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, gonna leave. And okay. Everything. All righty. Okay, let's see here. I gotta figure out which problem I'm doing here, because we're walking through the. Um, if you if you have the slides, we're walking through the cryptography, and we're gonna be doing problem number seven from task one. So right here is the problem that we have. And right now it just looks like a bunch of numbers. And you remember I was talking about my cells um, files. This is the list of all of the links that she has. And for the one that we have, it looks like, uh, okay. We're going to be using the ASCII to text because it looks like decimals in the try hack me here. So first thing we want to do in this case is copy what we have. And you can also use the hints. Don't make my screen bigger how? I don't know how to make the screen bigger. I'm, Ah, uh, bigger. Oh. Okay. Is that bigger? I can. Like, that's as big as I can get it. Because <laughs> I'm in the VM, the VM is not going to get any, it's not going to get it any bigger. So, um, sorry about that. Um, in Try Hack Me, with many of these problems, we have hints for you to be able to solve. So, if you click the hint on this one, it tells you it's a decimal to ASCII type uh, problem. So, we copy the 
the number, go to the ask you to hex, and then oh gosh, it's not it's not changing. Ah. Uh. Hold on, I'm... Trying to figure out how to... Sorry, um... It's supposed to be the whole Cali box. And I want... It's, it's leaving the screen and, um, and not... Traffic. There we go. That's better. So now we've got it going back and forth. So here's the decimal in here. When we when we paste our value that we got from the trihackme and hit convert up here, it has this link, uh, uh, this question that you now have to answer. And the question basically says, if you can't, oh, there we go. Can you see that? Okay, the question says, what year was Diana Initiative, uh, uh, what's the first Diana Initiative conference? So, now, if you've been with Diana Initiative for a while, you might know this off the top of your head. But if you don't, then you go to the interwebs. And I went to Diana Initiative. Uh, that org. Uh, there you go. And um, when you go into the about, let's see here. About the FAQs is God. Uh, let's see here. Hmm. There we go. They're about the NA initiative. And as you read through it, it tells you in in 2005, they got together for, for DEF CON 22, but they weren't called the NA initiative yet. Then um, they had their first event in 2016, and Diana initiative wasn't, wasn't formed until 2017. So then you go back to Try Hack Me, and type in 2017. If it would let me type in 2017, there we go. And submit, and you see, your answer is correct. Whoa! And you move on to your next, um, to the next question. Let's see here for the next walkthrough. We have. Um, Marcel is going to be doing a packet analysis, so I'll stop sharing my screen, and she's going to hop on to do that. Marcel, are you there? There. I am here. Okay. So I'm bouncing dropping. around between the CTF village room and this room. <laughs> Lots of You're a multitasker, a woman of many talents. <laughs> Things are hopping. Thanks for doing that walkthrough. That was great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna show is um, the TriHackMe platform. So just a, a couple of quick things on this. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about just sort of operationally, how these VMs work and things like that. Please note that there is a help button right here that will probably answer most questions that you would have. Um, our team are the ones who built the challenges. Um, we didn't build the platform, so, so start here if you have questions about how the platform actually works. And, uh, and then hit us up in the CTF Village chat if you have specific questions about um, the challenges themselves. And if you DM me a question, I will get back to you. I'm just uh, working on this other stuff right now. So. Anyway, so so there's that. Um, we have uh, a variety of different tasks, as you can see, and 
Jay, I think just walk through a crypto one. I'm going to walk through a challenge from the forensics category here. So, um, and as a side note too, if you have a question about a challenge, make sure you tell us like which task it is and which question it is. So like, for example, I'm going to do task four and I'm going to do, let's see, um, I'm going to do a walkthrough on this one question about bob.pcap. Dot ng. So these are links to the actual files. You can download them. Um, just it's off of Google Drive. If there is a link that's broken, let us know about that. But um, I think we've checked through everything. So so you're going to download this file from the Google Drive link. I already have it, so I'm not going to download it again. But but just so you can see how that works. And this is the same with any of the files. The VMs are different, um, but again, refer back to the, the help on, on how to navigate through that. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my Wireshark screen and, uh, and we're gonna answer this question. How many ping requests were sent in this capture? Which is an easy-ish one to answer, but uh, we'll step through it anyway. So let me switch over to that screen. All right. So um, let's see. Can I make this a little bigger? Yes, I can. So when I'm looking at a packet capture, um, and this will help you with all of the questions, right? Um, I typically will start with the, the menu bar statistics. And I like to start with looking at the protocol hierarchy. So that oh, just popped up in another window. Bear with me while I drag this over. There we go. And this is kind of small. I don't know how to make that bigger, but but you can try it on your own too. And this will show us all the, the protocols that are in play in this network traffic capture. And so the particular question we're, we're asking here is how many ping requests there were. I can kind of scroll down through here and see if I see any ping traffic. I do. There's Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, aka ping. Um, if I want to, I can just filter directly from here. But we can see that there's uh, 12 ping packets. So let's apply that as a filter. Selected. And press the manifesto up here. This is your filter bar at the top. Um, we you see all that ICMP traffic. But that's not just the requests, right? So if you drill down into the actual protocol here in the middle pane, which is the packet details pane, I can get this to cooperate. Yes. So we can see this is all like the header information for the packet. And type eight is a ping request. So we can drill down further on these packets, which I can do by right-clicking here, saying apply as a filter, selected. And now I have a filter that's ICMP type equals eight, which is the code for ping request. And we see one, two, three, four, five, six ping request messages, which makes sense since there was 12 altogether. So ping response requests, so on and so forth. So let's go back over here and Put that answer in and hopefully it'll be right. Submit. Yay, whoop whoop, our answer is correct. So that's a, a quick Wireshark walkthrough. Um, we might do more of these later, so, uh, so stay tuned, but I'm gonna pass it back to Jay so she can queue up the next person. Oh, I'm, I'm the next person. Okay. <laughs> You can queue up yourself. Yes. I, have, I have one more and then I'll be queuing on. I think that is going to be the one following that. But yes. Okay. <laughs> so let's see if I can do the screen thing right again. Let's see here. Hold on, hold on. This is going to do something stupid. I don't want it to do. Okay. So 
sorry, too many to, and try hack me. All right, so for the next problem, we're doing a walkthrough of a forensic, um, what is it, metadata um, problem. And we're going to be doing the wildlife, um, who is the owner of, wild, of this wildlife uh, JPEG. Um, let's see here if I can zoom in. Uh, can you see that a little better? Hopefully you can see that a lot better. First thing you want to do is download your image. Generally, when you get a question like this, is they're looking for the metadata in the picture. Um, I downloaded, uh, I, op I clicked the link, and it opened up. I then downloaded the picture, and I've already downloaded it, so I won't do it again. And then you can go online and look for an XF tool, um, an XF tool um, online, and let's see here, Jeff Jeffrey Image Meta Viewer is one of the most popular ones. I would just need to browse to the image. My download file, and here's the wildlife JPEG. Then I make sure he knows that I'm not a robot. Uh, I am a robot. I can't see this right. Oh no. Okay, here we go. And then view the image data. And now we scroll to find the use and the, the owner. If I zoom in on here so you can see this better, you will see that there's the exit data. And whoa, there we go. The owner's name is Wally Coyote. And I copy that, take that to the try hack me, paste it, and you can see you have a hint here that already tells you that the owner's name's got a period in it. A lot of time on try hack me, the 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 hint for the answer is going to have the the slashes are going to be put in your periods and commas are usually going to be put in and then you have to fill in the rest so paste that should we should we check the hint to see if we did the right thing oh look we did that it says exit data use the exit viewing tool and look for the owner's name field and we did that so we hit submit and we got this now, before we go, I want to show you that there's also an EXIF viewer tool within um, within Kali that's built in. Uh, sometimes you have to install it. So if I CD to my download folder, um, I don't know. Can you see this? Let's see. Plus, nope, that doesn't work. Uh, let's see here. I think I can zoom. Nope. I am so sorry for this. There we go. All right. And I want to do XF tool and do it to the wildlife JPEG. And it gives me that same information right here, the owner's name. And you would then paste it in, and voila. So right now, we're going to move on to Tabby, and she's going to do the walkthrough of one of the web uh, pen testing challenges. Hey. hey. I will stop sharing and leave. Awesome. So, all right, so I'm sharing my screen over here. I'm logged into the uh, room for the Try Hack Me. And we are going to look at this one here, which is Pickle Rick. So totally full disclosure, I went through this challenge like a month and a half ago when I was uh, QAing it, and I don't remember anything at all. So you're gonna get the like real experience of how this happens. So the first thing we're gonna need to do is deploy the VM. So we click deploy, tells us this little message, starting your VM. Um, VM has started real fast. So now in a minute, it's going to show us uh, the IP address of the machine that we're gonna need to try to break into here. While we're waiting on that, 
we're going to figure out what we're going to need to do to access that machine. So there's two different ways. If you have not purchased a uh, TriHackMe subscription, but you are using a free account, then you can connect with OpenVPN. And so we will set that up here while we're waiting. I'm going to say, let's do US East regular one. I'm going to say, download my configuration file. Yeah, I want to save it. I want to save it in slash temp. I like to make a directory on my computer for files related to a CTF challenge that I'm working on. Now, I happen to be running Linux, which makes this whole OpenVPN thing really easy to use because it's already installed. You see, they give you this file with information in it, and I can, I can launch OpenVPN like this. And it'll connect. Ta -da, there we go. And I'll put this unreadably small window into the background, and it'll just sit there and run. While we're still waiting for our machine to boot up, we'll also look if you have paid for a TriHackMe subscription, you can also do a browser-based Kali Linux VM so that you don't need to deal with getting OpenVPN working. But uh, OpenVPN does work on Windows, Mac, Linux, and there's directions on the TriHackMe site for how to do it. But uh, if you're a subscriber, then also you can do this thing with the, with the in-browser Kali VM, whatever works easier for you. So I need to get back to the room. We're back here in the room, and a nice thing is the VM that you've deployed doesn't go away just because you navigate away from the room. That, that would have been a real hassle right now. So I'm going to go back and view the challenge here for Pickle Rick. This Rick and Morty themed challenge requires you to exploit a web server, deploy the virtual machine, and explore the web application. OK, so I don't even know about web application. All I've got is this IP address. I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. and. I'll put it in here just so that I can remember it. If I need to remember it, it's right there. Um, I don't know anything about this machine, but good first step is usually going to be do a port scan on it with Nmap and see what's listening. So if I just call Nmap dash little s big T, it's going to try and do a TCP connection to each of the thousand most common ports. And that usually only takes a couple of seconds. All right, it looks like it's listening for uh, SSH connections and HTTP. So probably if we just go to this IP in a browser, that'll be the start that we want. So we'll go into our browser. And see what do we get? Rick is super cool. Listen, Morty, I need your help. I've turned myself into a pickle again, and I can't change back. Log into my computer, find the secret ingredients. But I don't know what the password was. OK, um, very typical next step in a CTF web challenge is to view the source of the web page. So let's look. And in fact, that's exactly what they wanted us to do here. Note to self, remember username. Username, Rick Rulez. So this is probably a useful thing for us to write down. So I'm going to go down here. Um, if, you're not, if you're not a Linux person, you use whatever you like. But uh, it's, good to, it's good to keep notes. That way you remember what's been going on. OK, so unfortunately, I don't see any kind of web application. I just see this web page. That's not great. Um, a common next thing to look at when you're looking at a web-based CTF challenge is a robots.txt file. Um, this is weird. This is not what a robots.txt looks like. So you can find out some more about robots.txt. Um, come on, is there a Wikipedia? Yeah, there we go, robot exclusion standard. We're clearly not going to read all this right now, but we can scroll. Here's some examples. This is what a robot 
TXT usually looks like. You say a user agent of a robot and what it is allowed or disallowed to go to. That's not what this looks like. So I'm going to guess that this is a CTF challenge related thing, but this is probably some kind of hint. So again, I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it into my notes document here. Um, that may be useful, but we still ain't got nothing. All we've got is this. So at this point, sort of a next kind of step is to see, can we guess other paths inside this web application? Let's see if I've got Deerbuster installed. All right, I got Deerbuster installed. So uh, Deerbuster is a pretty commonly used web application path brute forcing tool. So like it comes with a dictionary file and you can give it a URL and it will start tacking the, uh, tacking the entries in the dictionary file onto the end of the URL that you start with. So it says here, D Derby base URL options. So let's just, let's just see what happens if we run this against this in a very naive way. Well, that's chugging away and I'm feeling kind of impatient. So while that's going, let's go back up to our browser and just try guessing some things too. All right, pretty good guess. Um, because I mean, everybody that writes a PHP web app calls it, uh, calls it login.php, right? Um, let's see if they hit any hints for us in the page source on this one too. Uh, no, we don't got nothing, but we do have the username. And since we found a login page, we're just gonna cancel this Durbuster. Uh, it says username. And um, I, I mean, God's honest truth, I, I haven't watched this TV show, but I'm gonna guess that if I had watched this TV show, I'd probably recognize that this word wubba dub -dub -dub, has something to do with the TV show. So probably, but let's just plug these into the username and password field, see what we get. I'm um, going copy, paste, copy, paste. Come on, I need in. All right, cool. So this looks good. We we'll click potions. All right, creatures, other potions, Beth clone notes. We got nothing. Um, we had good luck with uh, finding a hint on the page source. So let's try that again. Anything cool in here? No, but we do have this box that says commands. Um, so this is PHP, maybe this is, oh, and the machine was running SSH, so it's probably running Linux. Uh, actually, we can get a little bit more information about that. So Telnet is like three decades ago's way of logging into a Unix machine over the network. It's unencrypted and, and it's a bad idea and we shouldn't do it these days. But uh, it also has other handy uses to just connect to any kind of TCP service. And so there we go. Um, this is the SSH protocol handshake from this SSH server and it tells us that it's Ubuntu. So here we go. We got this Linux machine. Let's try some Linux commands in here. Okay, so we can run Linux commands in this command panel. We're dub 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 data. Can we run ls? We can run ls. And here we got this file, super secret pickle in greed.txt. Uh, but note that this looks like it is the root directory for the website. Yeah, so. Maybe we can just access super secret pickling greed out of the browser. Turns out I actually need this. What do we got? All right, so they let us have this command panel here. 
Um, we used it to list out some files, and we can actually read the file. Um, can we also read the file this way? Well, I guess cat being disabled makes it hard for future Pickle Rick, but uh, if future Pickle Rick knows how to use a web browser, we're probably good. Um, I wonder if we can do some Unix trickery here, though. Uh, like read thing, redirect from this. Uh, okay, so if if future if future Pickle Rick has has been using Unix for a while, um, being cut off from uh, from Cat there isn't isn't going to hurt him too much. Oh, but more is disabled. But less works. So there's a few different ways we can get the contents of this file. Let's copy it. We're going to go back to the challenge. I think it meets the format. Let's paste it in and see if it likes us. We got it. So we've walked through a little bit of what we can do with the TryHackMe platform, uh, ways that you can deploy machines, ways that you can access them either by running OpenVPN locally or by going to your... Uh, browser-based access to a Kali machine. And we've done a little bit of enumeration, poked around on a website, and uh, we got a flag out of it. So I'm going to hop off here and give this back to Jay. Hi, um, Tyrone, are you around? Because we, we've got the mother load, and that is the pen testing. And he was very instrumental in building a lot of these. And if he's not answering, then you're going to have to do it, Tavi. All right, I'm going to do it live. <laughs> Tyrone, call it Tyrone. Oh, wow. Okay, um, we're being told to also bump up our screen sizes because they can't see the uh, um, they can't see the screens. Others, um, if you can increase like the zoom to like maybe one hundred and twenty-five percent, that's what I had mine at. Um, yeah, was mine readable? Mine's one hundred and fifty. Is it? It was still really small. So, okay, well, if I end up doing this next one, I'll make it even bigger. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened to Tyrone, so... Um, yeah, what are we going to do then? Let's try something. Let's do another challenge. Let's do All another right. challenge. We've got All a whole right. other hour before this session is done. So, yeah, don't we? We started at, started at noon. Oh, yeah. Or, or nine. Nine. We started at nine. <laughs> 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 somewhere. <laughs> yes. So okay. So um, all right. Go ahead and take it. You can Just do little, another little round. better. Now, okay, uh, Tabitha, can we do because there's a lot of questions being asked about how to connect to the VPN and um, okay, yeah. Can we just do an instruction on that? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, the got, nine I got Linux. Do, do either one of you have Windows or Mac? I have a Windows machine, but I'm using a, v, I'm using a, 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 a VM. And I, okay, so you I just connected the same as I did. You've got a Mac. Um, do you yeah. want to do a walkthrough, Marcel, for how to open VPN on a Mac? Well, I could, except for I haven't actually set it up for Trihack Me for this instance. <laughs> okay. So uh, it would be like, the, woo, real quick. Before that, I also, <laughs> want to address, I also want to address some other questions that came through uh, um, where they were asking about if you need to have a VM in order to do the challenges. You don't need a VM, however, it is suggested um, because it will make life a lot easier. A lot of the tools, and when I talked about building your um, your box, your 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 practice box, you have your tools in your Kali machine that makes it a lot easier for you to just be able to build. Now, Marcel, if you're trying to look at the screen in here, it will look small. I, I'm not. Oh, okay. <laughs> just check it. <laughs> but I got it in stage three. Oh, gotcha. But um, for those out there who are, who are questioning whether or not they need a VM, 
if you if you don't have a VM, you can you know, hop on down to a, a virtual box, download, and um, and then go to uh, Cali and download the the uh, um, the pre-configured uh, OVA file for your virtual box. If you don't have that option right now, you can then try to connect uh, to VPN to your actual machine. But you're going to run into a lot of problems because a lot of the a lot of the challenges don't always have an online tool available for you to use. So I hope that answers some of your question. I'm going to give it to Tabby and she's going to show us how to connect to VPN using a virtual box. You're not using a subscription one, right? You're using like I mean. I'm like I, I just have Linux on my laptop and I just did oh, app okay. install OpenVPN and ran OpenVPN and the file. Okay, um, yes. if, <laughs> if, if like I wanna I wanna comment a little bit more about what you were saying about tools and like whether you need to have a VM, whether you need to have Linux, whether you need to have Let's Kali. Go ahead. Um yeah, like ultimately, you know, all of this is just using using computer tools in unexpected ways or in, um, you know, in creative ways. And so, like, the right tool is whatever works for you. So, like, if you're a Windows expert and you know all about, you know, how to, you know, write scripts in Windows, you know, a lot of the things where you need to do some data massaging that uh, people would use CyberChef for online. Um, I don't know if we ever showed CyberChef, but it's pretty sweet. It's we, didn't it's a we didn't do a problem like that. There is a there is a problem for it, but we didn't do one. Yeah. Okay. So like you know, a lot of the kinds of problems that people would use CyberChef for. Um, I've been doing Unix since I was a teenager, so I use cat and sort and awk and those kind of kind of Unix Linux tools to do it. If you are a Windows person, like you can write scripts in PowerShell to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Whatever you know, whatever works for you. Um, so that means. You know, in a lot of cases, you don't need special hacker tools. You just need like general kind of how to do computation sort of tools, and whatever you're comfortable with is good. Um, occasionally, you do get to the point where you need to use some kinds of uh, security specific tools, and in a lot of those cases, a lot of those tools are written for a Unix or Linux focused audience. So, like, I'm pretty sure you can download and run Durbuster on Windows, but I've never tried it because it's just right there in the Ubuntu repo, and and I'm a Linux user. So, yeah. on Windows one hand, your life's going to be a little easier because you'll be if you're using if you're using Linux, like, then you're going to be doing the thing that most people are doing. But you don't have to. Like, whatever whatever is comfortable for you is good. Um, so Tyrone said he's ready. So do we want to do the walkthrough? We'll do the yeah. open VPN after Tyrone, and then we'll go from there. That works. Oh, yeah. Marcel, I'm gonna leave, and then you can let Tyrone. Wait, she left. Why she leave? Marcel, you don't want to let Tyrone in. Oh, there he goes. Perfect. All right, we're gonna leave and leave you at it. Okay, everyone should be able to hear me, right? All right, so what I'm going to do is I am actually going to share my screen. I uh, should be able to hear me. I made the mistake of kicking myself out of the room, believe it or not. <laughs> so I'm anxious to see how this is going to look, but um, everyone's all right, so everyone should be able to see my second screen. So this is the Kali Linux machine on one side. I am going to not use that. You know what feels weird is that I can't hear anything, so I don't know if anyone can hear me.
All right. Another tip and trick that you can do for your Cali Linux machine is to set up a an alias that will get your VPN up and running. Um, so I'm just going to simulate right now because I kicked myself. <laughs> I kicked my user out of the room accidentally. So I'm just going to uh, go to the room and maybe I'll just simulate it instead. But uh, I'm going to do the very last one, the pin testing one. I have an alias that will automatically connect to my Try Hack Me VPN called VPN2, and it's basically just connecting me. And once I'm connected, um, then what you can do is just run through the enumeration process, and then from there, you would want to connect to the uh, IP address that it's not going to show up for me right now because I kicked myself out and then you would start your process. Um, I might have missed a little bit of the earlier portions, but for anyone that doesn't have a Kali Linux VM, Try Hack Me does offer the um, a web based Kali Linux machine in case you want to connect that way. So the very first question in the very in the Pentas prep task. I'm just waiting for it to load up now. And there's a there's a, a reason why I put this Pentas prep one together. So anyone that does well here in, in task 26, then you should highly consider going after some of the uh, hands-on practical certs like the EJPT and the CEH practical. So the very first question would be, what is the um, IP? What is the, what it is? so I believe that one is, what is the, um, So you can do that. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> All right, so the very first question is what is the host name? So just a simple in map scan uh, will get you something similar. I can't believe I just did that <laughs> and not notice. Uh, PN dash P dash means all ports. You want to target the machine and maybe do a dash dash open. So something like that will be a verbose, fast in map scan with the service version and the scripts option um, enabled. The dash pn means don't ping. Um, dash p dash means all ports. IP address um, of your target. And the dash dash open simply means only show me the ports that are open. That is a, a really good initial MAP scan to get you started. Um, you will start to get information based off of that. The way that I created the tasks was um, as you start to answer these questions, the, the question will lead you to an answer for the next question. And then by the end, we should all get that secret stop text, um, which would be the ultimate goal on the administrator's account. Cool. Yeah, so I see someone who's looking to get into the OSCP. Um, once you do this pen test of prep, then you should think about how that makes you feel. Uh, this machine would be considered an easy machine in the OSCP lab. So just keep that in mind. That concludes, I can always come back at any time to do uh, another demo. I'm gonna need some time to set up another account and get that going. <laughs>
All right. So good luck, everyone. In QMU. So, so if we got something we can do before then, while I'm installing Windows, that would be probably to oh, everybody's gotcha. best interest. <laughs> I wasn't sure what was going on. All right. Um, I can. I don't know, Marcel. Can you give me read out some questions we're getting from? Because I'm like trying to go back and forth. And yes, yes. So, well, a couple of things. Um, we had. A couple of questions that have been fixed that people were asking about. So if you were trying something that you thought was right and it didn't work, try it again, please. Um, and then with regard to walkthroughs, um, everybody should be like in the TriHackMe platform now. So maybe they have some suggestions of something they would like to see us walk through. Um, uh, it says somebody hit the stop broadcasting. Um, Did we? No, we didn't. Yeah, we, we're still broadcasting. Yeah. I don't know who said that. Um, anyway, okay. So, yeah. So, if there's any requests for walkthroughs, we could do that. We could also wrap this up. It doesn't have to run for two hours and just let everybody right. have at it. Um, I mean, there's that option, too. I, I just wanted to do at least the walkthrough of setting up the VPN since people yeah. seem to be having problems with that. Um, yeah. I can show what I do with mine, which is just basically from a Linux machine. Um, yeah, and as we pointed out before, I mean, there's there's pretty good instructions on the TriHapney platform on how to do it. Is. So I, I kind of, to be a hacker is read the directions. Yeah, exactly. So so I'm <laughs> a little bit reluctant to like go over stuff about the platform. You know, we're here to support with the the challenges themselves. Um, and I just want to do a shout out to the team again. If you missed my intro, um, we had about a dozen people on this team, um, all volunteers building these challenges for you all to use. And uh, we've been working on it for, gosh, how long? Months, Jay, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. So, yes, uh, so, the beginning of the year. so be patient with us, please. We're all just here volunteering to, to help you get some, uh, some CTF exposure and have some fun and maybe win some prizes. Um, but yeah, I, I'm open to requests on walkthroughs. So we'll we'll play that by ear depending on what we get. Um, and I think- Yeah, I see the open VPN would be good is what, what somebody said. Yeah, all right. Well, Tabby said she was setting that up, right? So- Well, she's doing the one from Windows. Um, I can do the, the, like the Linux. Um, I am. I'm a little reluctant to do any walkthroughs right now, just because I, I'm dealing with like the chats in the different rooms. So, um, but James, no, I can do. I can do this one. Okay. I can do the, the yes. Okay. And well, then, um, yeah. So, uh, so you know, we we could share Jay like our history going back doing cyber competitions. Like, how many cyber competitions have we done together now? Ah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, then it's like a lot of them have been remote just because of the distance, like where we live. In the sense, it's really nice that it's available remotely. We're able to do the challenges. Um, yes, yes. Like we, we did, um, let's see. I know the first one I did with Tabby was the open VP, uh, the sorry, the open CTF at DEF CON, oh, right? Yeah. Yes. And she told me that was the first one she had ever done. And I was like, yeah, right. You're like killing everybody here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like, my first one, I didn't even know what a Linux box was. And <laughs> I wasn't that bad, but I was pretty close. It was like, I knew what a Linux was, but I didn't know, I didn't know about open VPN. So when people are talking about, you know, like, what are you setting up? It, it, it resonated with me because, yes, I was there. And it wasn't that long ago. You like know? you said, Jay, Google is your friend. Yes, <laughs> for sure. yes, um, yes. So, so I, I was just thinking back to, like, my very first cyber competition. And it was a digital forensics competition, the DC3 one that's no longer there, sadly. It was such oh. a good one. Um, yeah, tell me but, about that. <laughs> but, 
there was one question where you had to analyze a packet capture to figure out like what happened. There was an intrusion of some sort, right? And and I was assigned that question from my little team and I was like, okay, what's a PCAP? <laughs> <laughs> and now you're like the PCAP expert. Uh, well, I heard about expert. I prefer well, yeah, that. more expert than I am. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but it's kind of funny because, you know, when you do these cyber competitions, like, you don't even know, like, the long-term sort of effects that it's going to have. But, but yeah, like you said, like, here I have no clue what a PCAP is. And now I'm like all about <laughs> network traffic analysis. And would I have been exposed at some point in time? Yeah, probably. But but that got my passion kind of started early. Um, so you already talked about this in your, your presentation, but I think CTFs are, are so valuable for so many different reasons. Uh -huh. um, also, I should mention we have a uh, Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu CTF Slack. Um, I can share the link for that. Um, we've got about 350 people in there. We do competitions together. We build competitions together like this event. Um, and we pretty much always got something going. So like right now, um, there's a group of us that are doing the Cyber Reason CTF. Not that I have done any of it yet because I've been busy with this and work and stuff, but um, but there's lots of opportunities out there to get involved. So I will I'll get an invitation link and share that out with folks. Okay. Let's see here. We got some. Okay, somebody search for YouTube tutorial which help. Great, they're helping each other. Um, somebody's asking if Tyrone um, got cut off. He did not get cut off. Um, he um, he finished the, the walkthrough, and it basically was where he give you the 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 command line, which I typed in the chat box for how to scan, and then once you scan that, it will get you to your answer. I I think he didn't want to give you everything. Um, it's Aaron is a little stingy with his hints for sure. <laughs> he is. He is. Um, and you've got somebody asking for the link to the the uh, um, the Slack. So okay. yeah, I'm gonna pull yeah, that up in just a sec. I've gotta go. I've gotta go create it. Basically, make an open invite for people to join. Um, um, I see questions about hashes. Um, I can tell you that if you if you are using um, if you are using uh, um, say Cali for example. You have hash ID, which is a, 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 a built-in identif identifier, but you can also go online. If you Google, hey, remember Google. If you Google um, hash identifiers, there are a lot of them out there. And what it will do is, it, is give you uh, um, an, approximate, an approximation of what it thinks the hash is that you're looking for. And that can help take you to your next step of what you want to look for. Okay, um, we're ready for a tabby to come on and show us how to do VPN from a Windows machine. All right. So, hey, make uh, sure you increase I'm, the size. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry to be that girl, but like, I didn't actually have a Windows machine. Thank you all for bearing with me while I installed Windows Seven. So, y'all are gonna get to see my horrible looking Windows Seven. I hope you're not using Windows Seven anymore but that was the uh, version of Windows that I had an ISO sitting around for and was able to install in a VM here. So I'm here in my Windows 7 VM. There's no video driver, so everything's huge, but we're just gonna deal with that. So here we are. And the first thing we're gonna want is to go over here to access machines and choose open VPN. So we're here, we're on US East regular one, so I can download my configuration file. Um, and it's gonna give you this file that's your trihackme username dot openvpn. And uh, we're gonna save it and I'm just gonna save it. I don't know actually, where did you save it, Firefox? Uh, let's click this little button and see it. Okay, so it put it into my downloads folder. So we're gonna copy it and I'm gonna move it to the desktop just because that's gonna make life a little easier for me. All right, 
I'm going to paste this here. There's our OpenVPN file. Next thing that we're going to need is a copy of the OpenVPN software for Windows. And you get that from Google. And you can search for OpenVPN. Make sure that the link looks legit. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is this is legit. So we'll go to downloads. Um, we don't want the source code. Um, I don't remember what uh, whether this is a 32 or a 64-bit VM. Let's see, 64-bit VM. So we'll get the Windows 64-bit MSI installer. Going to save it. It's downloaded. Show me here. We're going to run the installer. Yeah, I'm going to install. And so now we've got uh, now we've got the OpenVPN installer running here. Yep, let's run this MSI. Um, you will need to be administrator because it needs to install a bunch of special network adapter drivers for the virtual network adapter that the VPN traffic will come in on. So it looks like we actually have OpenVPN now, and. Okay, so the GUI says, okay, well, I will see whether this works. Yep, it's saying if you want your files to be easy to open, you can copy them into one of these directories. But also, I see that my, uh, my config file also has this nice OpenVPN logo on it. So if we just double click on it, it opens in Notepad anyway, which was not the desired behavior. But looks like the OpenVPN GUI has registered a right-click handler. So I can say start OpenVPN on this config file. And now what do we got here? Um, failed to initialize tap windows. So I wonder if I need to reboot or if the problem is the... Uh, driver signing actually being for realsies. So let's let's reboot our VM and hope it works after we reboot our VM. It's been a while since I've seen this screen. Are you okay, Windows? I hope Windows is okay. I appreciate everybody's patience, as I hope that Windows appreciates my patience. Oh, that was that was interesting as well. Okay. Yes, I would certainly like to install this driver. Thank you. And that one, yeah, I'll certainly trust that. I mean, I asked you to install it, didn't I? Okay, so those uh, those do you want to install this driver prompts seem pretty promising. Still no love with the uh, tap Windows device. All right. So, can we,
let's see if there is a different one that we should be using. Let's let's try and go back to to a previous one. Let's let's try this older one. Okay, goodbye old OpenVPN, or rather goodbye new OpenVPN. Yeah, I'll close that because I don't need that anyway since it doesn't work. And now we will try this older not beta OpenVPN. Everybody, cross your fingers. We're all in this together. Yes, I definitely want all of those default choices. And now we're installing OpenVPN. Yes, please install Tap for Windows. It's the network tap driver, which I believe is uh, a concept ported over from Windows. I mean, excuse me, ported, a concept ported over from Linux because uh, the OpenVPN software was itself originally written on Linux. And so you need the special Windows drivers to be able to run it. But right now we're, we're installing .NET 4.0. Yes, of course I've read the license terms. I assume that this portion of the whole procedure where you try to get OpenVPN working is easier if you're not on Windows 7. So my apologies for that being the version of Windows that I had sitting around, but I think we'll get there. Let's check our... chat box here. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely quote, are you okay, Windows? <laughs> um, you know, there was a time, there was a time when, uh, when I really hated Windows because I used Macs and I just knew that, that Macs were greatly superior. And the longer that I have worked in tech, the longer that I've worked on computer security, the less I believe that anything is actually the best, but that everything is good at some things and bad at others. And uh, it's important to choose the right tool for the job. So, you know, I, I do ask, are you okay, Windows? But I ask Linux the same thing. Are you okay, Linux? Are you are you okay, OpenBSD? Are you feeling sick this morning? Boot my camera button real quick. I did not expect that I was going to be live installing .NET Framework Four today, but uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate everybody's patience with this. Yeah, that's a really good question, um, whether OpenVPN is working on WSL2. Um, I assume that it can't work on legacy WSL because it has to do so much fancy low-level network stuff that just doesn't exist in the world of original WSL. But yeah, WSL2, where you're really running an implied hypervisor and a real Linux kernel in it, seems architecturally as if it could work. So that could also be an interesting option for people who are on the newest build of Windows 10 and have access to WSL2.
I suppose we can interpret this experience as an advertisement for the uh, TriHackMe membership uh, because you you spend your ten dollars a month and then you click give me a uh, give me a Kali VM in the browser and then you have it, um, which would also be handy if you were trying to play like from a tablet or something. But uh, I'm 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 committed at this point. We are going to connect to OpenVPN from Windows one way or another. All right. Yeah, we got .NET. I always wanted .NET. Yeah. Cool. General quick start for Windows. Requires a config file. We got a config file. You can run it as a service, but that sounds fancy. Here's how to build it. I don't want to build it. I just want to try using it. So now we'll go back. We'll get, uh, we'll get a new clean Firefox window. And... Start OpenVPN on this config file. Hey, what do we got here? Windows tunnel adapter succeeded. Initialization sequence completed. So I believe that we are now actually on OpenVPN. Let's see if we can deploy a machine. Oh, Firefox, you helpfully, uh, you helpfully saved my username. I don't actually like that. Cool. So we're here in Try Hack Me. Let's see if I can remember the room name. All right. I'll use my real hacker voice. I'm in. So now let's go to one of these. Oh, I actually have the Pickle Rick machine still open. So with OpenVPN running, let's see if we can access Pickle Rick. So I wasn't 100% sure that I trusted uh, my OpenVPN connection or the Pickle Rick VM. So I tried going to it in the browser, but it's just spinning. So I've opened up a CMD window here, and I've typed ping and then the IP address. That's also not doing anything good. So either my VM is no good or OpenVPN was just kidding when it said, oh, Windows, Windows route add command failed. Returned error code one. And why is that? I'm going to try running the OpenVPN GUI as admin instead. Use import menu or copy your... Okay, so let's actually try that. Open VPN GUI import file. Downloads. Here's my file. Please import. File imported successfully. Connect. Does this look better? Uh, now connected. Okay. I've been fooled before, but... All right, we're here. So let's uh, let's go back to the beginning and pretend that this all worked from the beginning and go over what the procedure is. So first, we went and went to openvpn.net and downloaded a stable version of OpenVPN. So we're going to say, um, so we're going to, we're going to go in here. Sorry about that distraction. Um, we're going to go here and we're going to say community downloads. And I tried and did not appreciate the beta one. So if we instead go to the Maintenance release 249, select your appropriate version of Windows, download it, run the installer through to completion, 
and you'll eventually get to the point where you can go to your start menu and choose Open VPN GUI. Open, Open VPN GUI will show up over in your taskbar. And then you can go to the Try Hack Me web page. On the left side, under Access Machines, click Open VPN. Select the VPN server that's close to you. I'm going to say US East Regular 1. You say download my configuration file. Save it wherever it's saved, like in this case in your downloads folder. Go back to your taskbar, open VPN GUI, right click that thing, say import file. Pick that new file you downloaded, file imported successfully, and now I have two, so I get to choose which one to connect with. Go to it in the taskbar, right click, find your thing, say connect. Little window pops up, shows you a ton of information about the state of what's going on with your networking. And if you connect well, eventually it tells you, Tabby is now connected. Once we're connected, get back into the Try Hack Me room. Deploy a VM. In this case, I've got the Pickle Rick VM deployed. Copy that IP address and start doing your things with it. In this case, because I know it's a web server, just paste it in the address bar here. And now here, I've connected to OpenVPN on Windows and deployed a VM and connected to our Pickle Rick VM via Windows. I can go to login.php, and if I had the password, then I'd be able to get to the command shell, and it would be exactly the walkthrough that we had before, except on Windows. So I hope that that's helpful for people. Um, there's also the Try Hack Me platform help, which you can get to by clicking this button, how to connect to OpenVPN, And if you click around, you can get to this page, which I will manually type into the chat because I can't actually copy and paste out of this VM. I'll click it to make sure I got it right. Oh, you got to be logged in first. But uh, there you go. That's, that's how you do it live. I hope that you don't have the uh, struggles that I did with the OpenVPN version. But uh, if you're not running Windows 7 and if you choose the release version and not the beta version, I expect that you'll have good luck. Um, while I'm still here on video, we'll take a few seconds if anybody wants to ask any uh, specific questions. And otherwise, I will drop off and we will all wish you well in the CTF. Join us over in the CTF session and uh, we'll be there to text chat with you. So, um... All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. For I did do a Linux command quite some quite some time ago when I was on Linux. Yeah, what's the question? Hmm. Okay. You know, we I I remember enough of this. I, we can actually just go right back through this, and I will be happy to describe that. So, gotta type the file name correctly, or four fours at you. Um. So that, that's not the right thing. So we get our username back, which was on the source of this web page. Rick Ruelez. So we'll paste that in here. And the password was in the robots.txt. We'll paste that in here. We get the login page. Yeah, please don't save. You're not helpful. Okay. So 
so yeah, yeah, it is something with uh, with that symbol. So this is a this is a, a very very old school Unix ism where Unix tools are generally designed to accept data from their standard input and then output data to their standard output. And so if we just use this like it's a like it's a Linux prompt because it basically is. So we can run the echo command, hi, TDI, and it'll say, hi, TDI. But uh, now we can, we can run that same command, but pipe it to, say, the program cat. Oh, and it's going to smack us because you're not allowed to run cat. So we'll instead pipe it to DD because that will also work. Um, the this vertical bar character is the same thing as on the backslash key of your keyboard, and it connects the standard output of echo to the standard input of the next command. Um, actually, I'll do a little bit of magic here. Um, just so that we can see that it does something. I remember the syntax for this, it'll uppercase everything for us. I'm going to copy it in case I didn't remember the syntax for it. That's OK, so the pipe character takes the output. Uh, yeah, so the, the pipe character takes the output of one command and runs it into the next command. So like the example that I just did was um, and this is this is kind of fancy Unix stuff. Um, this is not super fancy, but it's like, you know, this would be this would be Unix two oh one, not Unix one oh one. Um so the said command can do editing on text. And so I've this said command here takes every instance of high and replaces it with by. Um, but now other things that we can do are like for are like, for example, we can do ls, we can see the files here. And remember, we can't just cat the file, which is the sort of normal Unix way of viewing a file, because the challenge doesn't let us. But there's a ton of other ways to read a file in Unix. So for example, the read built-in command of the shell will take some input and save it into a file. Not, excuse me, a file. Save it into a variable. So you do like read my variable. And now this is the other part of the pipe command. So you can put a pipe, the vertical bar, in between two Unix commands, and it takes the one and puts it into the other. But you can also do the less than symbol here, which looks like an arrow pointing to the left, in order to read from a file instead. So when I do this, this command here, which I'll type in over here, Um, is going to take the first line of whatever file you put and put it into the variable my var because that's what the read program does. Um, so then, because it doesn't let us do cat, but we know we want to know what's in this file. Now, if we execute this, there would be temporarily a Unix shell variable called my var that contained the ingredient that we wanted. But that isn't good enough. We need to actually see it. Um, but that's echo to the rescue. So now that we have a variable, we can say something like this. Uh, a command like this, the semicolon separates two Unix commands from each other. So it says, do the thing before the semicolon, then do the thing after the semicolon. So the thing before the semicolon is read the first line of the file.txt into this program read. And the program read takes whatever it reads and shoves it into the variable you specify. After we've done that, then run the echo program. And what I want you to echo is whatever the contents of the variable myvar is. 
And so we do it, and now we got the flag. Because we could have just catted the flag, but they didn't allow us to. So instead, we did something that was a little bit fancier. Yeah, yeah, Christina, I, I totally I totally love it. Um, big, big shout out to overthewire.org and especially the overthewire.org room named, I think, Natas. Let me fetch up a link for that bandit. Um, folks who, who want to start to learn or practice some Unix skills, in a fun gamified kind of way. Yeah, overthewire.org slash bandit. Um, at a previous job, the um, getting through bandit was actually one of the last parts of training for new people on the Unix team because it's it's fun, it's engaging, and it's it it covers a lot of neat stuff. So yeah, if you if you are new to Unix and you want to learn, you know your way around Unix command line. Um, I mean, honestly, the super ancient book from the '80s called the Unix Programming Environment. The the last few chapters of it are a super outdated view of how to write Unix programs. And so you don't really care about that. But the first few chapters are how to use Unix, like as written by a 1980s person. And, and I love the simplicity of it because the exact details have changed a lot over time. Like how do I configure uh, networking on Red Hat 7, you know, is, is totally new. But the details of like, how do I view a file? How do I list my directories? Stuff like that has all stayed the same over time. And it's got a very clear writing style. So I'm gonna try and get a, a link to that too, just because I, uh, just because I think it's a great, it's, I think it's still a great reference. Um, it looks like the, the used price of it is still around $10. It's been out of print since a long time ago, but uh, there's a, a billion copies of it floating around. It's called the Unix Programming Environment. There's a million other, there's a million other books if you like books for like intro to how to use Unix, but uh, this one happens to be my favorite, um, which tells you something about the book and also tells you something about me. So I hope that uh, I hope that this has been fun. I'm I'm gonna drop off, but uh, we've got some great links here in the chat for some uh, some Linux things. Thanks a lot for asking interesting questions and have fun at the CTF. Um, if you uh, if you want to start to learn something about Kubernetes, I highly recommend you check out challenge number 19, the VM called 7. Um, there's a lot of hints baked into that one. So if you check out the hints and, uh, and, and play with it, have fun, um, please come and uh, attack my Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> OK. Um... Thanks everyone. I am trying to share my screen right now, but my screen has decided it doesn't want to be shared. Or it thinks it's already being shared. Um, but we'll see you in the... Go ahead and ask your OpenVPN question. I hope I can answer. You're welcome, uh, Hema, I think that's how you say that. Let's see here. I don't understand why it won't let me. Mm. All right. Um, I will see you guys in the other room. Um, I hope the admin's in here to take over. Thank you, Tabby, for the walkthrough. Thanks, Tyrone, and thanks, Marcel, for your walkthroughs. We will be in the session room if you've got any questions. <laughs>